I grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons, and as a result, I became uh, a enthusiast of comic book strips and then comics in the newspapers, the Sunday newspapers. There was one that appeared, it may have actually gone obsolete in the 90s, a comic strip by the name of Frank and Ernest. The cartoonist was Bob Faves. Has anyone ever heard of Frank and Ernest in this room? A few of you, okay, yes. Frank and Ernest was basically the male version of Thelma and Louise. They were always getting into scrapes. They were not the brightest bulb in the socket. And each comic strip was about their, you know, their Keystone Cops behavior. One comic, uh, comic strip, Sunday Morning Paper, had Frank and Ernest dying and both going to heaven at the same time where they appeared before St. Peter at the pearly gates. Peter looked down from his high lectern with a scowl, piercing dead at Ernest, or as he often went by Ernie in the comic book, the comic strips. His buddy Frank, standing right next to him, seeing this scowl from St. Peter, looked at Ernie, and his buddy was wearing a t-shirt from the 1960s which read, Question Authority. And Frank looked at St. Peter's scowl, and he looked at Ernie's shirt, and he leaned over and he whispered to Ernie, you know, it might be a smart thing to take that t-shirt off in a place like this. That is good advice. Uh, it is at times appropriate to question human authority. We might be even justified in doing so. But it is absolutely foolhardy to question the authority of the Lord God Almighty who created all there is. And everything that exists does not exist without him. The Lord God Almighty, who on his resume and his resume alone, says that he knows the thoughts and intentions of every being, living or dead, who alone has creation at his disposal to use as he wishes. If this Lord God Almighty desired, he could take the smallest bacteria and bring mankind to his knees. Or he could take the sun and make it stand still and bring mankind to his knees. And on and on we go. And this is what is before us in these ten plagues as we're journeying through the thicket of it. God, if he wanted to, of course, could have sent an angel and dispatched that angel to Egypt, dressed in heavenly battle array, armed with a flaming sword in its hand, to clean house. But he didn't. He could have, if he wanted to, use a foreign potentate to come in and conquer Egypt and liberate the Israelites from slavery. But he didn't. Rather... He turns creation on its head and uses things that man should have had dominion over to dominate man. And so when we read the ten plagues at 30,000 feet and we contrast them, say, to the first two chapters of Genesis, we see just what has happened. There in Genesis, you'll recall, the six days of creation God created everything out of the sound of his mouth. Everything was good. And it was good, as we learn later in the commentary, because man was to have dominion. And as long as that happened, there was peace, harmony, and balance in the universe. But the plagues teach us the reversal of Genesis 1 and 2 where now God, at the sound of his voice, makes creation now dominate the very entity, humanity, that should be dominating them. And that is a bad thing. And we see destruction and chaos and tumult on every story 
in the ten plagues. And so this reintroduces us to the order of creation. And we come now to the fourth plague today. We're going through these at a snail's pace. Now a word about the fourth plague. It begins a new series of another set of three. You have these in your notes that I've sort of constructed. The way the text is, is there's three sets of three plagues. Plagues one through three on their own, with their own significant elements, plagues four, five, and six, plague seven, eight, and nine, and plague 10 stands all to itself as the most personal and the decisive one of all. Now, plague four begins um, like plague one began and like plague seven, the first set of the three sets. In that, in Plague 4, like we have in Plague 1, uh, this would be chapter 7, verse 15 of Plague 1, where Moses is told to go to Pharaoh in the morning while he's down by the water. Only Plague 1, only Plague 4, and only Plague 7 have that. By the time you get to Plague 7, Pharaoh is probably nervous when his alarm clock rings that he has a visitor waiting for him when he goes worship his pagan deities down by the Nile. But this is the second time this confrontation with Pharaoh occurs. The other connection with plague number one is that plague number four is the only plague thus far, like plague number one, to use a Hebrew term that is translated release or in our translations, probably famously, let my people go. But that only appears in plague one and plague four and will again in plague seven. Again, three sets of three. And here we have a little play on words where God tells Pharaoh, if you do not release my people, I will release flies on the land. It's the same word. So he's having fun with that word, a word play. Now, as to the plague itself, it does take on the similar structure of each plague. And if there's one thing I want to screw into your conscience today, Calvary, if you forget everything of the data and the journey we've been, the key theme that goes all the way past the plagues into chapter 14 at the Red Sea. The theme here is God is the boss. God wants us to know that. He wants Israel to remember that. This is meant to comfort us in 2023 that come what may, and we are living in precarious times, come what may, There is still only one boss man in the universe. There's still only one numero uno. There's still only one that sits on the throne and no one will deter him from accomplishing his mission. So that theme, God is the boss, threads together all of these stories and we see it again. Here, I'm going to use what ordinarily is point two, to be point one today. So three truths to teach us that God is the boss and we can apply them to our church's life and our life as God's people living today. The first truth is that God's actions are always intended to show the world who is the boss. So let me say it another way. However God reveals himself to you in answered prayer, in a trial of faith, in the fruit of ministry, in the blessings and joys of life, you pick your medicine. However God is demonstrating himself to you, it's guaranteed to remind you he is Lord of the universe. Only he can do certain things. Only he can make it rain. And only he can save a soul. And these are reminders in our life. I'm the boss. You're not. 
You're not in control. We make our plans and God laughs, right? Because he's in control. He is the boss. And that's the dominating theme of all of these stories and how they're linked. And so God's actions are intended to show the world just who the boss is. Now let's descend into our story today. Let me show you some unique elements that has not come up yet. Now chapter 4 is beginning to turn the page a little more significant, a little more obvious what God is doing. First, his actions are uniquely powerful in our lives and in here. Let me show you just a few of them. Number one, I want you to see that the powerful tool he uses to bring about this plague of flies. More of that in a moment. In plagues one, two, and three, as you'll recall, the instrument that God chose to use to demonstrate his power was Aaron's staff. Aaron took his staff, he struck water, it turned to blood, frogs hopped out, he struck the ground, insects descended. In plague 7, 8, and 9, the tool that God will use to bring about the plagues is the staff of Moses. So he switches. We're never told why. Moses, Aaron's staff will never come up again. But in the middle... Plagues 4, 5, and 6, now God chooses to do his plagues with a different tool. No staff is mentioned. The only thing mentioned where these plagues come to be is by the power of his word. God, you see, is showing his muscle. He's showing who's boss. I don't need a stick uh, I, to, to show my word. I can use one, but I don't need it. And I think this is provocative. This is, again, picking a fight with the magicians who, by the way, never show up again. Never called upon again. That's not by accident with the storyteller. But remember, plagues one, two, and three, when they did show up, they always brought along their staffs. Because in Egyptian black magic, a magician, staffless magician, was like a Jedi Knight without a lightsaber. Or a gunslinger without an ivory-handled colt. It just would be backwards. But God is showing, look, I don't need to be propped up with little magic incantations. I can use a staff if I want as a means, but I don't have to. And this is a good reminder for us. God can use whatever tool he decides to flex his muscle to the world. He can use, like Moses, an 80-year-old washed-up shepherd has been, or he can use a teenage shepherd boy to show his power. Jesus went so far as to say, look, the rocks can cry out if I so choose. And that means... He can use you. He's given you talents, a personality type, giftedness, all sorts of ways to use you to flex his muscle to the world. Think about the gospel. God could have sent an angel to he from heaven to speak the gospel. God could have you sent a galactic planet. God have, could have used his finger. He's done that before. But instead, the primary use of spreading the gospel is I'm looking at it. Earthen vessels and pots of clay, as Paul says. So let us never underestimate the power of God in using or not using matters that he chooses to do. So there's no staff here. He simply makes it happen through the power of his word. Notice also, second, the destructive force of his power and what he uses. This really gets into the meat of the story. Another first 
of the plagues is that flies bring destruction on the land. In fact, there's a word here used that is never used in the first three plagues. It's the word in your translations translated as ruin. So in your notes, you see how I've divided. Even the, the plagues sort of have a digression. It, get, it is getting more dire and more, uh, more desperate, more dark conditions. The first three are sort of plagues, what I call nuisances. A frog, for example, is not that dangerous. And those are plagues they could actually recover from. The, the, the bloody river became clear again after a week. Frogs died off and this, that, and the other. But plagues four, five, and six begin to introduce a term we have not seen thus far. These are plagues to ruin Egypt, plagues of destruction. These will not be easily overcome. Old men will still be talking about the flies of 23, right? It will take a long time to get over their destructive power. And by the way, the same word used here for ruin is the exact same word used for the destroyer who comes at the end of Plague 10 and ruins Egypt by destroying every firstborn child. It is also the same concept used at the Red Sea where Israel marches through that Red Sea and that same Red Sea, not a different one, the Egyptians walk on and they are ruined. So now we get into darker language of what God is up to to flex his muscle. Um, Sherman, when he marched to see both he and Grant, they were buddies, and they had this mastermind constrictor warfare method. And only Sherman and Grant believed the Civil War would go on and on, and it would not be one in six months. It would be bloody. And Sherman did his scorched earth policy. He said later, not because I loved it, I did it to teach the Southerners a lesson, never do this again. Never do this again. And this is God showing the Egyptians and the world, this is what happens when you take my people from me, you will never do this again. By the time I'm with you, I will bring Egypt to its knees and they will never recover. Egypt has never been a superpower ever again after this moment. Well, here we are with flies. You know, flies are, I don't know about you, but I think of them as the catfish of the insect world or the chickens of the insect world. They are dirty, filthy animals. I mean, look at the things they feed on. Manure, dead bodies, or dead carcasses, and wet, weak old garbage. They are nasty, nasty insects. I remember singing, a, when I was a kid, a song taught to me, shoe fly, don't bother me. There's even a thing called shoe fly pie. Did you know that? That the Amish make shoe fly pie. What in the world were they thinking with this dirty animal? I don't think the animal's in it, or the insect is in it, rather. But flies are a nuisance to us. Even if there's one, we want to get rid of them. But that's really not what the writer wants us to think of. Think more of on a summer night when you're out on your deck or you're out on your patio hosting friends and the flies start to come in and they land on your bare leg. And once they were a nuisance, but now they become more of a nuisance when they bite. So a few nights ago I was out, I had some biting flies, I'm saying, are we starting this again? And that is the insect what we're talking about, a biting, blood-sucking fly. And the text tells us they cover the land. Imagine a corn stalk and thousands of flies on it and they chew the tassel, they chew the fruit, and then they bring that plant to the ground and then they head into the palm trees on the Nile. They strip it clean, it's a skeleton, and then they chew it to the nub. And then they concentrate on cattle grazing in the field and the whelps of cattle. And even kids playing in the sand are bitten by these things, go in at night and there's whelps all over them and 
Egypt, you know, I hate to break the news to you, but they didn't have air conditioning back then. So they had wide open windows. And so these flies are flying around food. And you go to the restroom and there they are. You go to bed and there they are. And they are covering the earth. Again, God flexing its muscle. I read a story that happened in the early part of the 20th century of a majestic tree situated in a strategic cliff in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And this tree was estimated to be over 450 years old, which is unfathomable to me, which would make it, by the dating, a sapling when Columbus discovered San Salvador. It had withstood 14 lightning strikes, blizzards, tornadoes, and even one earthquake, and still remained this towering, majestic tree situated strategically on a cliff by itself. But one day the tree fell and died. Scientists looked at it, and it was a group of beetles that had got under the bark started chewing the inlay of the tree, laying its larva, which only reproduced to chew more of the bark, and slowly compromised the structure of the tree. It wasn't a blizzard. It wasn't a lightning bolt. It wasn't an earthquake that brought this majestic tree down. It was a bug. And that's the image here of Egypt. Everything in its path is being destroyed, literally eaten alive by these things. And so... We not only see the means that God can use, and we see the severity that God can use, but we see even the timing shows his power. When Pharaoh finally calls for help, Moses gives him a precise date. Tomorrow they'll be gone. And not only a few of them will be gone, they won't slowly die off, they'll be gone immediately. And we're told that in the text. Moses prays, and when he prays on that very hour, that very moment, Every fly disappears, which again cannot be an accident. It is an act of God. So his timing is perfect and all-powerful. And of course, the second point here about his actions that is introduced again as a new message in the plagues that was not explicitly taught in plagues 1, 2, and 3, But now, every plague is going to have this message. And that is that God's actions are not uniquely powerful only. They are distinctively covenantal. So if you read the Bible through and you wanted to get one basic message that dominated every story, I would suggest the dominating theme of the Bible is God deserves all the glory because he's God. I don't think you can improve upon that. But second, likened to it, would be that God is always in the business of saving his people. He's always looking out for his people. He is never abusive. He's never indifferent. He's never detached. He's always working for the good of his people, never the bad, even though we might say it's bad. Never the bad. He cannot do that. That is not in his character to do anything bad to you. And so what we have for the first time that will now be a common factor all the way, all the way really into the end of the Bible is this distinction, this covenantal distinction between my people and your people. That's the message that Moses goes to Pharaoh. That I'm working for my people, not for your people. Now this might, excuse the pun, bug us a little. Make us uncomfortable. More of that down the road as we see this full-orbed manifestation. Brothers and sisters, we're thankful that God works for his people. We see this. We see this in the text where there's a distinction that the flies will cover the land of Egypt except for one place, Goshen. Now, I don't have a map in front of you of Goshen, but your mental 
capabilities. Goshen is on the east side of the Nile River. It's in the Nile Delta, which means that the rest of Egypt surrounds it. For example, let's suppose that Johnson County had a massive infestation of termites, unlike any before in the world. Now, when I moved to Lenexa, um, my exterminator told me there are two kinds of houses in Lenexa with termites, one that's got them and one that will get them. That was his definition of, so he sold me his little termite uh, bait, you know, bait station. So let's imagine that these termites literally hit every house in Johnson, in Shawnee, in Overland Park, in DeSoto, in Olathe, except for Lenexa. And if Lenexa houses remained unscathed, Every biologist and geologist and scientist would be flying here thinking, this is not an accident. Let's test the soil. Is it the elevation? Is it the way homes were built? There is, it's not an accident that all these surrounding cities get in, th infected by this pest, but this one that is literally in the heart of Johnson County doesn't. And of course, Interestingly, on everyone's insurance, it would say probably an act of God. So why is Goshen left untouched and all the rest of Egypt that surrounds Goshen not touched by fly? Did they have a giant Venus flytrap? Was it the Golden Dome? What was it? We're told what it was in the text, or more particularly, who it was. God says... This is my people, and I'm going to protect my people. They're not going to be harmed. Your people will, because you have harmed my people. And get ready, buckle up, because this goes all the way. I mean, Israel, don't get, they don't get boils. Egyptians do. Israel's cattle are saved. Egypt's isn't. Israel doesn't experience darkness. Egypt does. Is this an accident? No. Israel walks through the same Red Sea, they're saved. Egypt walks through the same Red Sea moments later, they're completely destroyed. Why? Because God has a people that He protects, that He saves, that He nourishes, that He's always in their corner. And when some other entity works against His people, those are fighting words, you see. And that is meant to be saved and, and, and meant for our comfort. So we have this little line that comes up in these, uh, this plague with the flies where Moses, speaking for God, tells Pharaoh why he's making this distinction. And what does he say? Verse 22, So that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. You cannot compete with God. You see what he's saying? These are my people. I'm protecting them. But I'm also going to show you that I own the universe. And that includes Egypt. And if I want to put flies in Egypt and attack your people and save mine, guess what? I'm the God of the universe. I can do that because everything belongs to me. I mean, this is God showing who's boss. Now, we might not like this, but we do it all the time in nature. So all of you parents, in a few moments when we leave and you go to the nursery and there's you know, seven babies in the nursery and you go to pick yours up, you don't say, ah, any which one will be fine. Just give me, what, give me any and I'll... No, you pick your child. So you do this in life. And of course, Peter and the apostles will translate this in the New Testament to the church of Jesus Christ. Where Peter, using Old Testament language, you might recall, will say, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. 
The Bible in the New Testament will describe all kinds of separation between the righteous and the wicked, from the wheat and the tares, to the sheep and the goats, to the time where people will gnash and weep and the others will rejoice and be glad. All of that is paralleled between my people and your people, two different peoples. Anita, I've shared this before, when I go home and I say, babe, I love you. She wants to hear that. That is a compliment. She does not want to hear, baby, I love you, like I do every other woman. Um, I, I would get more than a firm talking to if I said that. That does not compliment her. She wants to know she stands in a special class all to herself, no competitors, no rivals, no one else. This is the joy we have as being God's people, that he loves his own in this special way as he ransomed and gave his life for many. Now, that brings us to point number two, truth number two. God as the boss does not negotiate he makes demands. This is the entire story. It goes in actually two parts, but I want to focus on this negotiation technique with Pharaoh at the end. When flies are destroying the land, Pharaoh knows he has something to do. Interestingly, for the first time, he does not call on his magicians. They are persona non grata and will only show up once again just to show sort of as a secondary information that they got boils too. But never again does he ask them to come to court because he knows they don't solve problems. He knows, and we can see him inching a little more to accepting the truth, though he never does, that maybe I should consult with Moses because he can solve the problem. So he doesn't even bother with his magicians. He calls Moses and has this con uh, conversation. He does capitulate a little bit, but he remains hard-hearted, even though he's half-hearted. Notice what he says there in verse 25. He will allow the Israelites to sacrifice, but they must remain in Egypt to do so. Have you ever heard the cliche, the devil's in the details. Always read the fine print. This is the fine print that Pharaoh slides in. This was not a part of the original plan. And Pharaoh knows this. He knows what God demands. Total, complete, release, bar none, all or nothing. But he says, yeah, you know, I, okay, you wanted to worship God the way, go worship, but do it in Egypt. Moses' response, if you look at it, might cause you to raise an eyebrow. One would expect Moses to say, in verse 26, No, no, Pharaoh, you know perfectly well that our God, who is bringing destruction on you, requires us to leave the land. Instead, Moses' response in verse 26 seems to be, Oh, no, fair. We wouldn't think of doing that. That would offend you guys. We don't want to offend the Egyptians. We don't want to offend their religious sensibilities. They might hurt us. We're all about, you know, kumbaya. We are the world. Group hug. We couldn't do that. What a curious thing Moses says here. I mean, does he really have to say it that? Hasn't God shown four times that he's pretty mighty and can do anything he wants and he doesn't need Pharaoh at the negotiation table? So why does Moses say this? Maybe no one else is in the room is curious other than myself. I've spent a lot of time thinking, this is, this, this is not normal that you would say this in these conditions. And I think it's best to see it in the context of what Pharaoh is doing. He is sparring with Pharaoh here, Moses says. He's matching wit for wit. In verse 25, Pharaoh slyly gives the impression that he's giving in and then slips in a deal with the clause of the fine print of restricting them to the land of Egypt. 
In this light, Moses' response, I think, is to point out the foolishness of Pharaoh's suggestion that it would be Pharaoh causing the offense of his own religion. Here's what I mean. Moses is saying, look, don't even try it, Pharaoh. You know, as well as we do, that if we were to remain in Egypt and sacrifice to the one and only God of the universe among a bunch of polytheists that worship everything, that they would stone us. And that's exactly what you want to happen. You want them to stone us. You want to get rid of, you want to, sh you know, to, to shape us up so we'll fly right and quit this talk of release and get back to being a slave. But I'm not going to play that game. And so this would be like, I don't know, uh, roasting a pig in the parking lot of a synagogue or, you know, going to Ramish's hometown and firing up the hamburger grill. Uh, I mean, this is, this is going to incite violence and hostility. Pharaoh knows it. Moses knows Pharaoh knows it. And so Moses is calling his bluff. After all, Moses once upon a time was an Egyptian. He knows how Egyptians think. He knows how Pharaoh thinks. And he's not going to buy into this. And so it's all or nothing. We either go or we stay. And if we stay, you feel the muscle of God. But we're going. Let my people go. Total Total, no compromise at all. Still, we see in verse 28, Pharaoh wants to hold on. Okay, go ahead, just not too far. So he wants to let him go, but he cannot. Ever dealt with a pagan this way? Wanting to come to Christ, but they won't let go of their sin. Even in his renewed capitulation is very half-hearted. If we see it in verse 28... I will let you go to offer sacrifices. Isn't that nice? Thank you, Pharaoh, for letting us do this. So Pharaoh's repentance, we see, is only on the surface. He has not learned the full weight of God's power. And later, God will harden his heart even further to accentuate this point. Nevertheless, Moses goes back and he prays to God that this plague would cease. And as I said a moment ago, we see that in the power of God, that it stops as quickly as it starts. Again, demonstrating Yahweh's complete and total power, which brings us finally to our last truth. We will not linger here too long because we linger here. It's here every plague that hard-hearted men will never acknowledge God as the boss themselves. After all that had happened, this story ends with the final verse, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time, and he did not release the people. Like a bob wire stuck in his chest, Pharaoh yanks it out, more trouble than ever, but never turns and never lets God's people go. Well, there's the story. What lessons can we bring for our church's life and for our lives today? Too quickly. This is your homework assignment. God is the boss, so stop compromising with Egypt. That would be my firm application. God is the boss of the universe, so stop compromising with Egypt. When it comes to obeying God's word, there is never any negotiations, no compromise. Halfway measures is not for Moses, and it's not for us. God is bigger than the Egyptian gods. He's bigger than their magicians. He's bigger than Pharaoh, and he's bigger than our foe, which is behind all this, the evil one, Satan. Sometimes Egypt power seems oppressive, but just consider that none of the powers of this world, though they try and though they root their ugly head against us, none of them can stop Jesus from releasing himself from the grave. That's the power of God. 
And that is our power that we have because we love God and we serve him. You might recall your Roman history where Mark Antony, in a um, bombastic view of drama, rode a chariot into Rome in a Roman parade. The chariot, typically for a victorious commander, would be drawn by two horses of pure white. It was always that case. But Mark Anthony decided to dispense with tradition and drove two lions in his chariot into Rome, showing that his power could even subdue the lion. Sometimes I think the typical Christian is trying to drive the chariot of their life with two lions, the lion of the pit and the lion of the tribe of Judah. But you cannot do that. So you must no compromise with Egypt and its systems. There is always light and there is darkness. And we cannot compromise and we cannot fellowship with it. What would we think of a guy that said, I want to light my house on fire to see how much I can burn without it burning down? Or a guy who would say, I want to take a cup of arsenic every day just to see how far I go without dying. If we knew people like that, we would get on the phone, call a hotline, and have the guys with the little green monkey suits come in and take him to some asylum because they need help. But it's foolhardy for a Christian to try to negotiate with the world that is pressed with evil. We cannot have, for example, a hymn book in our pocket and a pornography in the other. We cannot be on Sunday people of worship, but Monday through Saturday we live like the world, lie, cheat, steal, and look no different. This will not do. No compromise. I have shared with you a story I actually grew up on. It's about a farmer, and he has a pig and he has a chicken. And the chicken wakes up Saturday morning and says, I'm feeling in a generous mood. Why don't we provide the farmer breakfast? And the pig says to the chicken, for you, it is only contribution. For me, it is total commitment. <laughs> right? You <laughs> lay an egg, I provide the bacon. This is what must happen to the Christian in this world. Total, undeniable, leaving Egypt, letting the people go, releasing, never to go back again. A worldly Christian might as well be talking about a heavenly devil. They do not go together. So I would urge you, as I would urge me, because God is the boss, and we know that, then leave Egypt. Lastly, because God is the boss, live in the freedom of his grace. Let my people go. That is the mission of God, release them. They are not meant to be slaves. They are meant to be my sons in their own land, worshiping me like they should. The text does not say give them partial freedom. Let them have two or three days of rest from their soil. No, let them go free, free altogether. God's demand, you see, on us is not to have a little liberty, to have a little rest from your sin, but to go right out of Egypt into the wilderness to the promised land. God does not say, I will make Pharaoh make their tasks less heavy, make the whip less cruel, or put kinder taskmasters over them. No, they will go away from slavery away from captivity. And beloved, the same is true for us. Jesus Christ did not come to make hell less hot for us. He did not come to make sin less damnable. He did not come to make our lusts less mighty. He came to put all those away and say, you are my people. You are free from all those things. And it's all because of my grace. Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite Spurgeonisms, and I have many, but I'll never forget this when I needed it as a 15-year-old. It came to me in a book I was reading by Spurgeon, 
and I have never forgot it. And it has done me good, and I give it to you today. Here is the line. Free grace can go down to any gutter and bring up God's jewels. Divine love can rake a dunghill and bring out a diamond. There is no spot in the universe where God's grace cannot and will not go. That is precious. And you need to understand that. I am convinced if Christians understood what grace was, then counseling rooms would be emptied. Then bitterness in relationships would be dissolved. Then marital difficulty would be renewed in grace. If we understood, what does God's grace mean? It means you're not a half a slave anymore to sin. It means you can charge hell with a water pistol and say, eh, 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 because of the cross and resurrection of Christ. One of my favorite movies, and more on that in a different day, is the movie Amistad. It is based on a real-life uh, Supreme Court argument made by John Quincy Adams. He was the only ex-president of the United States to become a member of the House of Representatives after his term of office ended to argue a case before the United States Supreme Court. How's that for a trivia contest? And he argued the case of, US, uh, of the uh, HMS Amistad, which was a slave ship. And his speech, you can actually download. It's in the Supreme Court annals. It's epic. It's an epic speech on his appeal to his ancestry. And he's arguing for the release of, I believe, 40 slaves to go back to Africa on their own accord. And the leader of this is an African by the name of Sinke. And during the movie, Amistad, during the court, before John Quincy argues and takes up his case, his attorneys are arguing for him. And Senke, who cannot understand English, tries to learn English on the fly. And the only word he can remember is freedom. And in this court, during the heat of this exchange, of, before it goes to the Supreme Court, Senke, chains and all, rises to his feet and starts screaming in English. The only words he knows in English, give us freedom, give us freedom. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ has given all of us. He's given us total, complete freedom from sin, death, and hell, made possible only by the God of the universe. And that is enough. Now we have to go live it. Father, I thank you for this assembly. I thank you for their love for you. God, we are bombarded with Egypt. At our job, in our social media, at our schools. Lord, we drink it in every day. Help us to be lights in a dark world that only can come through the power of your gospel. Encourage every weary saint in here who feels beat up, who feels they're a slave to sin, that not by their willpower, but by the work of Jesus, they are made free. That is your desire for them. That is what you came to do to inflict your power on the enemy of death, hell, and sin. And we're thankful that we are free indeed. Help us to go live that way. We ask in the sweet name of Jesus, our Lord, and for his sake. Amen.